Hi everyone, welcome to the What is Family Medicine webinar. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the American Academy of Family Physicians. On behalf of the AAFP, we want to thank you for watching. We hope that today you'll learn what it means to be a family physician and where the specialty of family medicine can take you in your own career. My name is Erin Clark. I'm a fourth year medical student at Campbell University School of Osteopathic Medicine and I'm planning to apply in family medicine. I'm currently working towards my master's in public health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I've been serving as a national coordinator for the AAFP Family Medicine Interest Group Network. I'll be your facilitator today. So before I introduce our guest speakers, I have some quick housekeeping tips. We will have our Q&A at the end of this 60-minute webinar, so at any point, please send your questions in using the questions panel on your GoToWebinar screen. If you need technical help or support, you may also use the questions panel. Our presenters today are Dr. Natasha Bayon and Dr. Wayne Altman. Dr. Bayon lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and she is the Emerging Market Medical Director at One Medical. She completed her family medicine residency at the University of Arizona Phoenix Family Medicine Residency Program and earned her medical degree at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Dr. Beyond's interests include adolescent medicine, LGBT care, pediatrics, and women's health. She's an active volunteer and an advocate for marginalized communities in her area. We're very grateful to have her with us today. Dr. Altman is the Jaharis Family Medicine Chair of Family Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts. He completed his residency training at the University of Massachusetts Family Medicine Residency after receiving his medical degree from the university's medical school. Regularly recognized in the media as one of the top doctors in Boston, Dr. Altman is passionate about nutrition, group visits, and preventive medicine. He is the co-founder of wellnesscampaign.org, which is a nonprofit that helps people make positive and lasting lifestyle changes to improve health. We are excited about everything he has to share with you today. Both of our presenters have incredible stories to share about family medicine, and they're thrilled to show medical students why family medicine is the specialty of opportunity. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Beyond, to get us started. Great. Thank you so much, Erin, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm so excited about our time together. Well, let me start by sharing one story on why I chose family medicine. It's just one out of a collection of a ton. Now, when I was younger, I actually wanted to be a journalist. And so I wrote for our college daily newspaper. I covered the science beat. And one time I interviewed a patient who had a heart transplant. And now the story was about his artificial heart. And you know what the patient told me? He told me his goal was to play poker without getting short of breath. And he credited his family doctor for recognizing that goal, for valuing that goal, and for helping him achieve that goal. Now, it's so interesting because family medicine to me, it's a lot of things. You know, now I get to work in this cutting edge tech based primary care organization called One Medical, which started in San Francisco. But family medicine, it's really about relationships. It's knowing patients and knowing their goals, like the patient who just wants to play poker. And I'm in a system where the delivery model and the technology and all of that it ultimately helps support that doctor-patient relationship. And that's really what I love about family medicine. Next slide. Now, the thing that's so interesting is primary care is so important to the health of America. More than half of all office visits in America are to primary care physicians. Next slide. Now, when we look at who are primary care physicians, Family medicine makes up about half of all of those primary care visits in the US with internal medicine and pediatrics making up the rest. Now, as we kind of look a little bit deeper into the classic primary care specialties, let's dive into the differences. So who is it that sees infants, kids, adults, and has options for specialization? Well, that's MedPeds. And the ones who see kids and specialize are pediatricians while the ones who see adults and can specialize, well, they're internists. Now, family physicians like us, we're able to see kids, infants, adults, we can do women's health, procedures, specialize, and most of our graduates are practicing primary care. But here's the reality, guys. When we think about the different specialties, it's not as simple as saying adults plus kids plus procedures equals family medicine. 
What makes our specialty really unique, it's that patient-centered philosophy and that approach that's emphasized in family medicine. You know, I love to provide excellent care to people. When I was thinking about this week, it's really the relationships that are meaningful. So this week I had this patient come and see me and she just got engaged. And she was so excited to tell me because I remember I saw her the day before her first date with this boy and she was so nervous and now she's engaged. And she told me she's gonna come see me in a few months after her wedding to remove the next Blanon that I placed because she wants to eventually pursue pregnancy. And really that experience with that patient, it really made my day this week. You know, we build these really deep bonds with patients and they're like no other. In family medicine, we put patients first. We care for everyone. And family physicians, you know, we're adaptable. Patients know that I'm on this healthcare journey with them. They're the drivers and I'm the passenger. And they know that I'll do anything with them. We, in family medicine, we use meaningful evidence that matters to patients. And I love that family medicine's actually very cutting edge. So changes in healthcare can often be really slow, but family doctors are at the forefront of innovative healthcare delivery models, like group visits or integrating behavioral health, doing team-based care. And we're the ones at the forefront of utilizing things like technology, like wearables, for example, and figuring out how do we use those to benefit our patients. You know, in family medicine, we do a lot of research and we manage a lot of complex care. So we'll coordinate multiple diagnoses and coordinate various members of the team. And I will kick it off to Wayne to chat a little bit more about this. Thanks so much, Natasha, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be talking to all of you uh, in this uh, in this setting and in this format. Uh, you know, when I went to medical school, uh, I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist. Uh, I loved uh, counseling patients and 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 uh, uh, treating mental illness and promoting mental health. and And then my first rotation in third year was internal medicine, and I thought, oh, I like this a lot. This is a lot of fun too. And then uh, during the course of third year, I, I started to become enamored with adolescent medicine. I thought, this is pretty cool. And then my last rotation of third year was family medicine, and I fell head over heels in love with family medicine because it, it really had all of the things that I enjoyed uh, in those other um, things I listed. But more importantly, there's this culture of family medicine that I got to know in that six week experience at the end of my third year that I fell in love with. It's this culture where people are really patient centered, people are outside the box. Your your approach to helping a patient is to do whatever it takes to help that patient. It may or may not appear in a medical textbook or in an algorithm or on an evidence-based medicine uh, resource. Uh, but you're kind of thinking, what can I do that will be most impactful to help a patient? And, you know, um, a, a few things have happened for me over the course. I've been out of residency for about 20 years now, and um, I've struggled with helping patients who are dealing with uh, uh, overweight and uh, obesity and weight-related illnesses. And then I learned about group visits, and for the last nine years, I've been running this innovative group visit program with a uh, dietitian in my office, and we've had extraordinary results. And it's uh, every Tuesday night, I, I see three groups of uh, about 10 patients each, uh, and uh, we work through a 15-session program, and it's so much fun. Uh, I often go an entire morning or an entire day without looking, looking at my medical record because I have a medical scribe who's writing all the notes for me and kind of doing a lot of the scut work that needs to be done. And I go patient to patient all day long, doctoring, doing the things that I always wanted to do when I was in medical school. And uh, I found myself uh, doing a, a global health experience. There's a sister medical school in India uh, with my medical school, Tufts, uh, called Christian Medical College in Valor, India. And um, they, I helped them develop uh, one of the first departments of family medicine in India at this medical school. And uh, the first chair of family medicine was an internist named Alka Ganesh. And um, the bylaws of the school said you had to have five years of experience in that department to be a chair of that department. But since the department never existed, 
they had to choose an internist to start uh, start the the uh, being chair of the department. Now there's a family doctor mm-hmm. who's chairing the department. Anyways, I, I was sitting with Alka Ganesh talking with her, and she told me that she understands the culture of family medicine more than she's ever understood before working with family physicians. She said when she was in an internal medicine session, she was rooting for the disease. She would see patients. She would start imagining all the different things that could be going on with that patient, ordering lots and lots of tests to explore all of those possibilities and almost hoping for the most rare disease to show up because of how interesting that would be. And that sounds kind of bad, but I think all of us can kind of identify with that. There's an excitement, an academic excitement about discovering interesting things about our patients. Uh, And when she switched over to the family medicine uh, clinical area, she discovered that all of a sudden being in this culture, she was rooting for patients instead of rooting for diseases. She was figuring out what the story was behind this patient, behind their family, and rooting, uh, rooting for them not to have diseases and not to have uh, rare, interesting things happening to them because she was so connected with them and their family. And that's what I really fell in love with, that, cu- that patient-centered culture of family medicine along with um, the people who I was with in a family medicine sen- setting who really shared a lot of my values and philosophies of how I wanted to uh, approach uh, patient care. Um, Next slide, please. So um, when you think about your training, if primary care is something that you're thinking about, really family medicine is the training that you would want to have because um, really the educational resources in a family medicine residency are all geared around uh, primary care and cutting edge uh, models within a primary care setting, such as integrated behavioral health, group visits, the use of medical scribes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in a uh, a medical, uh, an internal medicine residency or a pediatric residency or a med peds residency, what you're going to find is that there is primary care training legitimately, but it's a way less in terms of number of sessions. And the uh, educational resources that you have uh, in those uh, residencies is completely geared towards uh, hospitals and subspecialty medicine. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so um, in, a, uh, in an internal medicine residency, um, uh, this is a study from 10 years ago in June of 2000. Eight, uh, this was published, and it showed that the percentage of people graduating from a medicine residency going into primary care was dropping to about 20%. Ten years later, we're now in the single digits. Less than 10% of internal medicine residency graduates uh, choose a career in primary care. Now, a lot of people will say in response to that, that's okay. Uh, I'm going to do a primary care track within that internal medicine residency or pediatrics or med peds. Well, it turns out uh, only about a third of medicine residents are, uh, who do a primary care track are, are going into primary care even after doing that primary care track. And I actually don't think this is a bad thing. I think when you do a residency that's completely focused around hospital and subspecialty medicine, it makes sense that the vast majority of people do hospital medicine or subspecialty medicine. And in the rest of the world, in most developed countries, there is no such thing as a general internist or a general pediatrician. A general internist is a hospitalist for adults. A general pediatrician is a hospitalist for kids. And that that actually makes a lot of sense. And I think that's uh, slowly where we are headed in this country, or actually not so slowly, Uh, Next slide, please. You can see um, similar numbers for pediatrics, uh, which are also now down to about a third of uh, residency graduates going into primary care. And when you look at um, when you look at um, uh, the data, uh, it's a little bit skewed because when you look at med peds and pediatrics, a lot of folks who chose hospital medicine still check off that they're doing primary care. Not sure why, 
but it does it does skew the data. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Wayne, that data is actually so fascinating to kind of shed some light onto. And I'm going to kind of switch gears and chat a little bit more about why family doctors are so thumbs up awesome, guys. So, you know, one thing I really like about family medicine is we're able to care for anyone who walks through the door. And no other specialist in America can do that. But you can do everything in family medicine, or you can do anything and choose to focus your practice. So, you know, just this week, I placed an IUD. I froze some warts off a patient. Um, I helped one of my patients maintain his sobriety. He's been sober since February, and he's so thankful to me. And I helped a patient who's a transgender female with their ongoing gender transition by prescribing her hormones. And I love that variety. But I've got colleagues who focus on things like sports medicine or obesity medicine. And so you can really create your career in a way that suits you. And the reason why is because in family medicine, we've just got a lot of options. So if you look at this slide, this kind of talks a lot about, um, you know, it's from a survey of physicians who are members of AAFP. And it sketches out, like, what exactly are family physicians doing on the ground? We can do a lot, right? So there's all kinds of procedures that we can do. So we can do skin biopsies, vasectomies, allergy testing, colposcopies, and so much more. And part of what makes family physicians incredibly good at taking care of all patients, it's the ability and the training to perform a broad set of those procedures. So I wanna point out that these procedures capture the different areas of scope of family practice. So there's some maternity care in there, there's sports medicine, there's urgent care. So if you're going through your rotations and you find that you really like doing procedures and you learn a lot throughout all your rotations and you kind of like it are, all, um, the chances are that you'd probably be a pretty good fit for family medicine because you get to apply those technical skills in lots of different areas. But again, I wanna emphasize you don't have to. That's what's so great. We call it the specialty of opportunity because you can tailor your practice the way you like. Next slide. So, so Natasha, you, know, as you, you don't see, do all 30 of those uh, procedures do in your least, office? I don't have enough hours in the day to do all those procedures, but I do a lot of them because I like the variety. But you know, in my practice, and I think Erin kind of talked about, I have more of an emphasis on women's health um, and LGBT care. And so I tend to get more of those patients and patients come through word of mouth. So patients will tell you they like their experience, they'll tell their friends and your panel just builds more and more. And I've got colleagues who are sports med docs and their team physicians. So it, it's truly, you make family medicine what you want to make family medicine. But you know, as you can see, it really is fun to do a lot in family medicine and stay challenged. But you guys might be asking yourselves, okay, like are these features of family medicine superficial or do they actually have an impact on outcomes? So here, it's from a 2015 study and that addressed this very question. They looked at a sample of family physicians and primary care physicians and they compared patient outcomes based on the comprehensiveness of the services offered by the caregiver. And they found that increased comprehensiveness in family physicians, it was linked to lower total Medicare Part A and B costs. And it was also associated with decreased hospitalizations. And so, you know, these results really illustrate that medicine and advances and new technologies and all that stuff, it's great and we can tackle old problems, but really it's those set of skills that we have as family physicians that are very valuable. And Wayne, I'll let you chat a little bit more about the skills that we have. So another way to look at family medicine is that we are the specialty that specializes in that which is common. And there was a study a while back that showed that 16 of the top 20 reasons why a human would go see a doctor in the United States were seen more by family docs than any other kind of physician. For example, uh, more family docs were seeing high blood pressure than cardiologists, more family docs seeing depression than psychiatrists, more family docs seeing rashes than dermatologists. And you can see that here um, as you walk through this chart, uh, the similar things with cancer and COPD and asthma, <clears throat> and again, anxiety and depression. And what's interesting is um, we, we don't exclude patients uh, from anything. So while we have a set of, uh, of uh, conditions that we see more commonly, um, there are no exclusions. I had a patient a few months ago uh, who was uh, struggling with low back pain that was not responding to traditional treatment. So I called up an orthopedist and said, I'd like you to see this patient. And uh, he said, oh, I don't do low back pain. 
I said, what do you mean you don't do low back pain? I didn't know you could discriminate against diseases. And it <laughs> uh, turns out you can. Um, and so uh, late, later that day, I got a phone call from a, a, a would-be new patient. And she said, I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And I'm on 20 different medications. And I have all these other conditions. I've had multiple fractures. I'm very complicated. Is there any chance you'd be willing to take me on as a new patient? And I said, well, what do you mean? Of course, I'm happy to take you on as a new patient. We, we, don't, we don't say no to that. We, 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 we take everybody. And there's something really gratifying about that philosophy of taking everyone and specializing in that which is common at the same time. Now, we've heard uh, from time and again uh, over the years that uh, sometimes students get a little bit daunted by that breadth. And... Um, and I can totally understand why you would feel that way at this point in your training. I would cha challenge you to find a family medicine resident who still feels daunted by the breath. Somehow, I think there's so much overlap in the healthcare and the diseases of adults and children and the elderly that what might seem so broad as a student feels just right as a family physician, especially because the treatment of any condition is really always in the context of that patient and that patient's family. So that leads me to another important uh, topic in medicine. And we, we have so many warts on our current healthcare system. And one of the most shameful things about our current healthcare system is that we take care of marginalized patient populations so much worse than folks who have resources. And it's something I think most of us are pretty ashamed of and would like uh, to have a part in improving in our healthcare system. Well, it turns out primary care and family medicine is a big part of the antidote of uh, healthcare disparities and decreasing those healthcare disparities. You can see here some statistics. And on the next slide, uh, you can see that um, if you are a person without health insurance, you are between two and three times more likely to not get diagnosed with your cancer until much later in the game, make, giving you a, a huge disadvantage in terms of your treatment for that cancer. Uh, but for every primary care doctor you inject into a particular community, you are dramatically decreasing these healthcare disparities. And uh, I, I think it's really satisfying to be part of that solution. So on the next slide, these set of, uh, next set of slides are really interesting. Uh, along these same lines, the red areas are health professional shortage areas in the United States of America. And these are all the different areas where there aren't enough uh, primary care docs. And um, if you were to take this map and you were to tell all the pediatricians in the country, congratulations, you can go on sabbatical for the next year. On the next slide, you will see the additional handful of red dots that would also become health professional shortage areas as a result of this year-long pediatrics sabbatical. Uh, that wasn't a really good idea. Maybe we should let them come all back to work. So the next idea on the next slide is we've given all the general internists a year-long sabbatical, and you can see there are another handful of districts or health professional shortage areas uh, in the country, um, uh, but, but not too many. And then as you go to the next map, that's where we started. That's the overall number of health professional shortage areas. And on this final map, if all the family doctors went on sabbatical, this is what our country would look like in terms of health professional shortage areas. So this, this tells us uh, two things. Uh, one is that a big part of the culture of family medicine is a passion for serving the underserved. And the other piece is that we can go anywhere we want and we are needed. Um, and I'll hand it back to Natasha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that map is so fascinating to see how healthcare could just be decimated in this country without family physicians. And, you know, Wayne, like you and I talked about the day to day of family medicine. It's really fun, right? It's moving. It's fulfilling. We've got these really great relationships with patients. We get to share in their joys, like their graduations, and we get to help them through their struggles like divorce. But, you know, the day to day, while it's so fulfilling and wonderful, the times I feel really powerful in medicine, it's when I think about our impact on the healthcare system. Now, if you look at the next slide, this is a picture of people who don't have the answer to healthcare's problems. It's politicians, Are you right? sure? 
they, well, they go on TV and they say they know all the answers. They tell us they've got all the answers. Here's a little secret, guys. They don't. But I do know who has the answers. That's on the next slide. It's you guys. You guys are the ones who have the answers and you're the key to answering America's healthcare problems. And that feels really amazing. And if we look at the, the current US healthcare system at a glance, you guys know it's pretty dire. I mean, we spend so much per capita compared to other wealthy countries and we don't get a lot in return. We've still got millions of people who are uninsured. Our life expectancy is actually worse. We have poor access to primary care, unfortunately, and our overall healthcare system ranks last when, cared, when compared to other similar developed countries. And I mean, even more than that, we're last among industrialized nations in preventable deaths. But here's the good news. You know, if we make improvements to our system, we can prevent more than 100,000 deaths annually. And so how do we do that? Here's the answer. If you invest in primary care, people will live longer and the healthcare system will spend less. You know, an adult with a PCP spends about 33% less on healthcare costs. Next slide. To really hit that point home, this video clip is from June of 2010. A patient posed a question to then President Barack Obama at this town hall on the ACA. This patient had multiple medical issues and he credited his PCP for keeping him healthy. So he asked about family doctors and our healthcare system. And here is a quick two minute clip on how Obama responded. You might wanna turn up your volume. Um, this issue of, of, of primary care physicians is absolutely critical. And it, it has the promise of making such a big difference in the overall health of everybody, from children to seniors. It, you know, it used to be that most of us had a family doctor you would consult with that family doctor. They knew your history. They knew your family. They knew your children. They, they helped deliver babies. They, and as a consequence, what happened was is that uh, everybody got regular checkups and could anticipate a lot of the problems that are out there. Now, in these big medical systems, so often what happens is is that. Uh, you're shuttled around from specialist to specialist. Uh, oftentimes people don't have a primary care physician that they're comfortable with, so they don't get regular checkups. They don't get regular consultations. Preventable diseases end up being missed. And you don't have the kind of coordination that's necessary between all these different specialists, right? So you go to one doctor, they take a test, then you go to the hospital, they have you take the same test, a lot of errors occur because there's not communications between these various specialists and it adds a lot of cost because each time that test is being taken they're charged they're charging medicare if you're on medicare and if you're not on medicare they're charging the insurance company and that is part of what is adds, adding to all these costs so what we've been trying to do and this was a major focus of the health reform bill is how do we get more primary physicians, number one? And number two, how do we get more power so that they are the hub around which a patient-centered medical system exists, right? I, I just, I love that clip because Obama is speaking to an ideal healthcare system. And that ideal healthcare system, it gives primary care physicians more power. But in addition, on the next slide, you'll see Having a system of nearly one primary care physician for every subspecialist, that's been lauded as the ideal healthcare system by the US Department of Health and Human Services. So, you know, that sort of system, it would get us to a model that we see in other developed countries that have better health outcomes like Canada, where, I mean, they have closer to a 50-50 ratio for every primary care doc, you've got a specialist. And, and that's kind of what we're trying to work toward. But, you know, what does that actually take to get it right? You know, to get there, we need 49,300 more PCPs by 2035. But you guys, it's absolutely critical because we know, you know, adults age 25 and older with a primary care physician as their own personal physician 
were 19% less likely to die over the course of five years. Even when you control for age, gender, income, insurance, smoking, major medical conditions, and perceived health. I mean, that, that's you guys. So it means that you guys are less likely to die during medical school and residency if you had a PCP. I mean, now, now that really drives home how important the existence of, of primary care doctors and family physicians are. And now if you guys need help finding a PCP, definitely email one of your faculty at your school and you can get in touch with AAFP as well and we are more than happy to get you connected. But you guys fear not, on the next slide you will see that there's some good news. There are a lot of people out there who are working to create a better system for both patients and doctors. And one of those groups is the American Academy of Family Physician. We've got a lot of advocacy power. We're the largest single specialty. You know, we've got lots, you know, over 100,000 members. And our family physicians, because we're on the front line of communities, because we see patients every day, we've got patient stories to share and we've got voices to amplify. And the people in Congress, they listen to us. And now, you know, on the next slide, we can play a little bit of uh, Where's Waldo here and see if you can spot me in this photo. But there is a, a large initiative because we know we need more medical students going into family medicine to help solve some of the nation's healthcare problems. There's this initiative that aims to get 25% of medical students to choose family medicine by 2030. And so how are we going to do that? Well, we're working to change the healthcare system to make family medicine and reimbursements and healthcare delivery models more appealing to students like you. And now for me, one of the most critical changes I'm seeing in healthcare is the shift to more value-based reimbursement models rather than fee-for-service. Now in traditional models, we pay doctors for doing things to patients rather than for doing things for patients. And now we're kind of shifting away and saying, we're gonna pay doctors for just taking good care of patients. And so what's the trend that we're seeing? I mean, as a result with these changes in healthcare, the trend has been in primary care, salaries are increasing year over year, while specialist salaries are mostly staying flat. And so you guys are really lucky because you're training at a time of great change and great potential. And Wayne will go a little bit more into that training. I love this slide. I, I see you front row, fourth from the right. Is that you? Yep, where's Waldo, you won. <clears throat> Now, uh, where can I get myself one of those great T-shirts that you're wearing, Natasha? I, I want have, one of those T-shirts. You know who has a lot of swag is the AAFP, so everyone should reach out to the AAFP if they want more and more swag. They've got all kind of family doc swag. Okay, I think I, I know some people there. <laughs> uh, fantastic. So um, I, I think uh, by virtue of you being on this webinar, I think many of you are interested in family medicine um, and uh, the AAFP, myself, Natasha, and certainly your faculty at your medical school are delighted to support you on this path. Many medical schools have a program during third and fourth year called Strolling Through the Match uh, to kind of help you through that process and get you to residency. And in that process, many of you will ask us, what is family medicine residency like? What is that experience uh, being in residency? And um, it, it, the family medicine residency is a very rigorous training that includes both inpatient and outpatient uh, training. And so you, uh, there are people who will leave a family medicine residency and then become a family medicine hospitalist and take care of adults and or children in the hospital. But the vast majority of people who complete a family medicine residency will take that kind of holistic cumulative training and, and translate it into a career in primary care. And the, the majority of the residencies are three-year residencies. There are about 600 residencies nationwide. And I would say about 25 of those 600 residencies actually have a fourth year allowing you to kind of uh, hone in on a particular area of interest that you might have in that fourth year. And, you know, all of them offer uh, similar things, but each program offers something unique. And, um, excuse me, in a, in a medicine or a pediatrics uh, residency, you could identify the two or three or four top residencies in the country and say, these are the elite residencies that are most difficult to get in. In family medicine, it's different because every program offers different aspects of, of community medicine and different, uh, different aspects of family medicine and strengths within their program, uh, that uh, there, there aren't any uh, 
consensus elite family medicine residencies. There are many residencies that would be elite for you, and your faculty will help you figure out which residencies those are. And um, you can see there are many different areas of training that, that may or may not be emphasized uh, within uh, that uh, residency, but they would all be part of the curriculum of that residency with a continuity of care being the, the focus throughout the training. And so many people in family medicine will have a particular area of interest during their training. And um, there are a whole host of fellowships that people can do uh, after a family medicine residency, uh, from geriatrics to faculty development to adolescent medicine to maternal child health, sports medicine is a very common one. And you can see a whole list of other areas that you either can get a former fellowship training in, or you can nicheify in these areas. Um, Natasha was talking about some of the areas that uh, she has developed a niche and, and other uh, family physician colleagues in her community know that she has expertise in that area and will send her patients in that regard. Uh, I have people all over the greater Boston area that will send me patients for our wellness group visits um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, other preventive medicine uh, uh, areas. And so uh, when you graduate residency, uh, while many people will do those fellowships, uh, most people do not do a fellowship. And at three years, within three years of medical school, you are out making money. We'll talk about how much money shortly, but making a good amount of money and uh, finally being on the positive side uh, uh, instead of paying money to schools, you're actually earning money. money. You, you might enjoy that when that finally comes. And there's so many different areas that you can be practicing. I mean, you, you can imagine office practices, but family doctors are practicing in hospitals and nursing homes and urgent care centers and community health centers and emergency departments and uh, in global health situations all over the, all over the globe uh, and, and also involved in healthcare system leadership, which we desperately need. Um, and, and coming back to what Natasha was talking about earlier, you can do whatever you want in family medicine. You can, you can go wherever you want in the country. You can work as hard or not hard as you want. For example, in my practice, we have seven family physicians, and not one of them is full-time. Every single one of them is part-time. We have one person who spends time doing addiction and suboxone work uh, outside of her practice. Uh, we have two of our providers who spend a couple days a week home with children. Uh, I spend uh, a lot of time with research and academia as chair of family medicine at Tufts. We have another person who spend, does a lot of work with health policy with our uh, IPA, Independent Physician Association. We have another person who is one of the physician champions of our electronic health record for our entire hospital system and we have another one who is a nationally known jazz musician and has a big concert tomorrow night if any of you are in Boston and want to attend so everyone kind of gets to carve out whatever work life that they want and carve out whatever uh, private time that they want uh, as a family physician so um, uh, it's it's um, if you look at this you can see where do physicians work uh, I told you you could go anywhere, but uh, when, when, the, when this question was asked, um, I like to ask folks, where do you think the most you'll find the most family physicians? And what I hear from most people is, oh, you'll see them in the suburbs and you'll see them in rural settings um, mostly, uh, but you're not going to see them in big cities where there are lots of specialists and hospitals. And uh, half of that is true. You definitely will see family docs in rural settings and suburban settings. But if you take a look at the numbers, next slide, you'll see the majority of family docs are in big cities. And then as you fly through these slides, you'll see that the, then uh, the next is in uh, medium cities and then smaller cities and then the suburbs and rural areas next. So it, it actually might uh, surprise a lot of people. Uh, and again, the moral of the story is we are needed everywhere. You can go anywhere you want. Um, and as you see on the next slide, specialists tend to be limited more where all the people are in bigger cities where family docs are really found uh, everywhere. All right. So 
uh, I've learned something along the way. There are two kinds of people in this world. Uh, next slide, please. People who care about money and people who admit that they care about money. <laughs> um, and when I uh, when I talk to medical students, a lot of medical students are do-gooders and want to make a difference in this world, a positive difference in the world. And thank goodness for that because we desperately need it. And I happily join you as a self-proclaimed do-gooder. And um, and and I just want to remind you that you can make some money and be comfortable financially and be a do-gooder at the same time. Those are not mutually exclusive. So if you look at the average income uh, that family physicians made, uh, the latest data from 2017, it was $209,000 per year, uh, uh, up $34,000 from five years ago. So you can see the trajectory here. And... Um, and so a lot of people say, well, well, what about us when we're just starting out? I bet that's a lot less. Well, actually, I counsel the third-year family medicine residents every year, and they are all getting offers north of $200,000, often with big signing bonuses. I never got a signing bonus. I feel like uh, I want to go back to residency, Natasha, and get a <laughs> signing bonus. Right. Uh, that looks exciting. I feel like a professional athlete if I could get a signing bonus. Um, and so for the last uh, decade or so, we've been the most recruited specialty. Uh, and so I, I think you can feel pretty good about your job security moving forward. And really the moral of this story is don't make decisions based on salary because this is a moving target. The salary we're going to be paying primary care doctors over the next decade is going to be going up and up. And the way the pie is is distributed uh, for other specialists is going to be changing. And when primary care goes up, specialty salaries are going to be coming down and it's already started. So if you make a decision based on money, uh, you might be disappointed by the time you get there. And so your decision has to be based on what puts a smile on your face when you wake up each morning and head to work, that you really love the work you're doing and feel like you're making a difference. That's how you should make this decision. Now, there's one other aspect of how we get paid. Uh, Natasha was talking about this earlier, how we've gone from volume-based care to value-based care. And, and we're getting, uh, all physicians are getting report cards about how well they're doing taking care of their patients. And so family doctors have been really good about putting systems together and uh, doing team-based care uh, to really accomplish this at very high levels, and which generates a lot of nice bonuses uh, that can be anywhere from you know five to ten thousand dollars up to even fifty or seventy-five thousand dollars extra salary at the end of a year of seeing patients if if your office has good systems. Um, uh, to have high quality on your quality performance. And we've worked really hard in my office to create this quality and to perform well on these systems. And uh, I'm very proud of the bonuses that we've gotten through providing better care for our patients. It's, it's uh, as you move to the next slide, it's funded by uh, basketball court in my driveway at home with the Celtics logo. It's uh, funded my Celtics season tickets. That's me up on the Jumbotron with my retro Larry Bird warm-up jersey. It's funded my uh, Patriot season tickets and my trips to the Super Bowl. I don't want to talk about last year. Uh, <laughs> it's funded my uh, new hot tub and some pretty cool vacations. That's Guajataca Beach in Puerto Rico. I highly recommend it. Now, uh, this is all very exciting, but as you look at the next slide, um, it's important to remember these quality measures are really in their infancy. Many of them are not evidence-based, and uh, we're still trying to figure out how to create quality measures that are truly evidence-based and actually help our patients and are accurate, uh, uh, accurately measure how well a physician is performing. So we truly do have some work to do uh, in that regard. Um, now, there's one other financial piece here, and that's the level of debt. Turns out the level of debt is not a predictor for whether or not people choose family medicine. In fact, you could even say it's a negative predictor because if you, if you, if you look at these numbers on the next slide, you'll see that the majority uh, or the highest number of people choosing family medicine as medical students have the highest debt. And there are a lot of reasons to explain that, uh, which is beyond the scope of this conversation. But suffice it to say, there are a lot of opportunities to pay back your loans that really 
uh, are most advantageous to people going into primary care as well as people serving underserved areas. And uh, your offices of financial aid uh, are really delighted to talk with you about the number of really excellent uh, loan repayment options that are available uh, that uh, allow you to um, uh, choose family medicine and not feel daunted by large loans uh, if you happen to be one of those people. Yeah, and I'll I love back to you, Natasha. I love seeing you in the hot tub at games. And I think we didn't chat much about this during this call, but also the family medicine schedule, it's so variable, right? So our, you know, where I work at One Medical, full time is considered 32 hours a week. And so people are making that salary working 32 hours a week. They've got one day to hang out. They've got the weekends. And so, I mean, you can really make your schedule in a way that you want to make it and have time to hang out at Celtics games and in hot tubs and go surfing if you want, which is really great. Um, now, in the Full time is also... Go ahead. I was going to say full time is also 32 hours for me. And when I yep. take call one in every nine weeknights, I will take one or two phone calls from home. And that's what call consists of for me. Uh, so uh, and I Wayne, believe in I hate living large. Yeah. And Wayne, I hate to humble brag, but I don't even take call. We don't do call. At, oh, this my is goodness. My so no call for me, which is great. And I've got my weekend. So now you guys, in the last few minutes, um, before we get into questions, and if you want to go ahead and submit questions right now, you can via the chat function. So feel free to submit some questions. But I wanted to take a few minutes to actually talk about and highlight a few family physicians who are out there working so you can see all the diverse and fun ways to shape your own career. So here is Dr. Benjamin, and she was the Surgeon General appointed by Obama in 2009, and she made breastfeeding and healthy housing top priorities. In the next slide, we see Dr. Barb. He's the president of the American Medical Association, family doctor who's championed health system and Medicare reform. In this next slide, we've got Anita Ravi. Dr. Ravi actually founded the Purple Clinic in New York City for survivors of sex trafficking and sexual assault. And she completed a reproductive health fellowship with the CDC. We've got Dr. Swick, and he um, is the retired editor for the editor-in-chief of the American Family Physician, which many of you guys, you might read articles from, and he actually spent a decade as the tour physician for the National Symphony Orchestra. And we've also got Dr. Martinez Bianchi, and she's a leader in global health. She acts as a liaison to the World Health Organization. Um, we've got Dr. Isabel Lowell, and you know, Dr. Lowell founded the Gender Clinic at Emory, and they also founded QMed, providing virtual care for people who are transgender across the US, which is a pretty incredible platform. And you guys might recognize um, Dr. Brantley. Now, Dr. Brantley treated patients with Ebola when there was an outbreak in Liberia, and he, he got, got a lot of press, obviously, and he was named one of the Times Persons of the Year in 2014. And here we have Dr. Ashwin Rao, and he is pictured with a Super Bowl trophy because he is the team doctor for the University of Washington Huskies, as well as the Seattle Seahawks. And on this next slide, you might see a familiar face. That's me. So, you know, in addition to the leadership role that I have at One Medical, I do a lot of media. So I speak to print publications like Cosmo or Bustle or Teen Vogue. I also do a lot of broadcast interviews locally and nationally. And it's pretty neat. I get to cover a pretty wide range of topics. But what I love most about these interviews, besides like the minor celebrity, it's that I'm able to show the public that family doctors can handle a wide range of issues. You know, you don't need a GI doctor to talk about GERD. I can handle that. You don't need to interview a neurologist to talk about migraines. Family docs can handle that. And really, anytime I'm approached by a reporter to speak on a medical topic, I always feel comfortable chatting about it. And that's a pretty amazing feeling for me. So I'm going to kick it over to Erin, and she is going to chat a little bit more about her experience with family medicine. Awesome. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Allman and Dr. Beyond for sharing their expertise and experiences with us today. Um, you guys are awesome. I can totally say that. Um, on behalf of the AAFP, we'd like to especially thank all of you for joining us. Um, so basically, this picture um, is my cohort of AAFP um, Family Medicine Interest Group Regional Coordinators and National Coordinators and some of our liaisons. So I'd like to talk about how family medicine has really just been the place for me. Um, 
as a first year medical student, I knew I wanted to do family medicine just because I loved everything. And that was really set in stone for me when I did my third year rotations. Um, so I'm really excited about my future in family medicine. I'm currently in a master's in public health because I hope to eventually work in a residency program or do some sort of leadership um, with underserved populations and really help family physicians take care of the, the communities that they live in. So on behalf of the AFP, we'd like to especially thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm going to ask, start asking some questions um, to Dr. Altman and Dr. Bion. Um, I think Dr. Altman, you mentioned the electronic medical record and your use of scribes in your practice. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the electronic medical record has affected the family physician's relationship with their patients? Well, you know, um, I used to talk to students uh, about 10 years ago in our medical interviewing class for first year medical students. And I was asked how the electronic health record is going to affect the doctor patient relationship. And, um, I said at the time, it's in its infancy. We're still figuring this out. It's kind of new for us. And about three, four, five years ago, I figured it out. It is not possible to really multitask and be connected with your patient while you have your nose in the computer and you're trying to do data entry. Uh, what we know about multitasking is usually when you multitask, you do multiple tasks less well than if you did them one at a time. And... Um, I find the use of medical scribes to be transformational. Uh, my medical scribe in my office is not only a person who writes my notes for me, but she also calls up patients, handles forms for me, fills out forms for me, um, and it becomes like my personal assistant in the office. And she's a person who has an interest in going uh, either to medical school or to PA school. So she'll be with me for a year or two, and then I'll write her a glowing letter of recommendation. I'll help mentor her along that path. She'll see many medical students in my office and get a lot of exposure to medical students and medical school and advice from them. Um, and then she'll teach my next scribe after her uh, how to deal with me, which is probably the most difficult aspect of being a medical scribe. And um, it is it is so uh, gratifying. I, I honestly, I think it's transformational um, how we're going to be dealing with patients and looking them in the eye and having dialogues with them instead of our noses in the computer. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that experience. Um, I guess kind of piggybacking on that question, um, where do you think nurse practitioners and PAs fit into family medicine? This is for either Dr. Altman or Dr. Beyond. Well, I'm, I'm happy to take this question. So it's really interesting because I actually work um, with nurse practitioners and physician's assistants um, at my practice. And now here's the thing. They have a different training and a different scope, but we all work together as part of the healthcare team. Now, guys, the thing is, like, they're, we're, we're kind of up to our eyeballs and patients here in America. Like, we don't have enough PCPs out there. And so we can use all the help that we can get. Like, we need nurse practitioners to be out there. We need family physicians to be out there. We need, you know, internal med docs to be doing outpatient medicine. We, we need everyone. So the way I view NPs and PAs is, yeah, different training, different scope. And patients recognize this, that as well. So they recognize that they are different than family physicians. But we work on the same healthcare team, and I, I work really closely with a nurse practitioner, and she's just fantastic. And you know, sometimes when I'm out, she's covering my patients, and you know, she's sending me pictures of rashes and asking questions, and I'm happy to help her. And I really appreciate the help that she brings to the team. And you know, really, I, I couldn't do it without her support. So, so I love working with NPs and PAs, and you know, I, I think that they also play a critical role in primary care along with family physicians. Awesome. Yeah, that's a really great perspective to show us. Um, can either of you tell us a little bit about burnout in family medicine and what's being done to mitigate burnout uh, among residents and young physicians? That's a really great question. Um, I mean, the burnout numbers are quite frightening, actually. And um, <clears throat> I think it it's really going to be incumbent upon all of you as medical students to really have a proactive plan, not to kind of say, well, that won't happen to me, but to kind of have a proactive plan about how to prevent that. And, and one aspect of that plan could be a career in family medicine. Um, there, 
and, and so then you might ask, well, there are, are there family doctors who are getting burnt out? And yes, there are. There are folks in every specialty who are experiencing burnout. Uh, I, I think a lot of docs in every specialty have not figured out that they don't have to do it all themselves, that they can work with physician assistants and nurse practitioners who take on a lot of the burden for you, that you can have medical scribes, that you don't have to take call, that there can be people in your office who do most of the paperwork uh, and forms for you, and that you can spend most of your time doctoring, that you don't have to work full time, that you can have other hobbies or things that you do uh, that are either part of medicine or outside of medicine. Um, and ultimately, finding meaning in your work and, and feeling like you've made a difference in people's lives and in the lives of, of your community uh, at the end of the day, there's probably no better way to prophylax burnout than feeling like there's meaning in your work and that you're making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll add on to that. You know, this is this is an issue. You know, promoting wellness is an issue across medicine, right? Everyone's got to tackle this. But I actually love seeing family physicians and you know the American Academy of Family Physicians. They've been kind of leaders and kind of at the forefront of recognizing this issue, diagnosing it, and taking kind of a scientific approach in how to manage this issue. And it's really cool. AAFP actually launched this new, um, I believe it's like a physician health and well-being conference. And so they have, you know, entire conferences dedicated just to physician health and well-being because it's something we really value as a specialty. And I think actually in 2019, I think it's in Arizona, so I probably should attend, but it, it's great to know that we value that as a specialty and, and it's something important to us. And we're on the forefront of finding ways to fix that. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know about that conference. I'm definitely going to check it out and would love any excuse to go to Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a little bit more um, nitty gritty details of practice, um, but it's a really important thing to think about. So we have a question about what type of liability do family physicians have? Like, do you worry about malpractice insurance and things like that? And how do you arrange for those liabilities? Not only do I not worry about malpractice insurance because my practice just takes care of that for me and it's really not that expensive actually, um, but I don't worry about malpractice because the biggest preventer of a malpractice lawsuit is your relationship with the patient. Mm -hmm. And my focus every day with every patient are my relationships. And patients don't sue on bad outcomes. They sue more on bad relationships. Mm -hmm. And so, knock wood, after 21 years, I have not, uh, I have not been sued, and um, and so I really don't think about malpractice at all. Yeah, such an interesting question. I've got to ditto everything that Wayne said. It's it's one of those things that things go wrong in medicine, correct? Like th things might go wrong, and medicine's complex, and we just know that if we have that relationship with our patients, they're not, they're not coming after us. Like they just want to know that they're in good hands and we're gonna to continue to take care of them and, and that's all. And I know plenty of family doctors who've gone their entire career and they've never worried about it because it just hasn't been a huge issue because we have a relationship with patients, we can call them up and we've got relationships with their families, right? So if something happens and even a patient you know, passes away, we know that patient's wife and we've already got a relationship with that patient's wife and that's one of the beauties of family medicine. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's a really good perspective to have just some good reassurance that it's not something we really have to worry about very much in family medicine. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, what would be your one piece of advice for medical students interested in family medicine? I would say I can I can kind of speak to this really quickly. My big biggest piece of advice is get exposure to lots of different family physician settings. Because if you've seen one family doctor, you've seen one family doctor. Be people practice in such different ways. So if you have one experience, I don't think that's enough. So I would say, you know, shadow lots of different doctors in different settings and sports medicine. I mean, there's like cruise ship doctors. There's all urgent care. There's all kinds of things we do. So try to get a pretty diverse exposure to know what all the options are. Awesome. That's great advice. I definitely second that. Um, so I'd like to thank Dr. Allman and Dr. Beyond again for sharing everything with us this afternoon. Um, we have really, really appreciated hearing from you. 
So we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. And if you're watching this live, you can expect to see a recorded version on the AAFP website very soon, along with additional resources about family medicine and how to choose a, speci how to choose a specialty. So you might not know that the AAFP represents more than 134,000 family physicians, residents, and students. And it's actually exactly 34,300 medical students all across the US. So as a medical student, your free membership with the AAFP allows you to access all of our resources so you can study like a family doctor with board review questions. I used these during my third year clerkship um, and read up on dozens of clinical topics in our peer reviewed journal, The American Family Physician. So if you're not a medical so if you're a medical student and not already a member, be sure to join because it's free. Um, lastly, for those of you turning in live, tuning in live, we'll hope you take a quick two-minute survey that'll pop up after this event. Um, but if you don't have time to take the survey now, it'll also be sent to the email address that you use to register for the event. So please let us know how else we can help you thrive in medical school and plan your future in family medicine. We thank you so much again for joining us. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks, guys.